The Pokemon franchise has always been known for its go-lucky and wholesome nature. I mean, it makes sense, right? It's the highest grossing media franchise of all time, and it's geared towards kids, giving it more income, as well as more good accessibility by fans, right? You can be a kid to play Pokemon, you can be an adult to play Pokemon. It's pretty much for everyone, I mean, as the rating suggests. And although this franchise does seem pure and innocent, if you just dig a little bit deeper under the surface, you'll find that in the depths there are dark truths waiting to be unraveled. In today's video, we're going to take a deep dive into the dark story of the Pokemon Ultra Ruin timeline, a canon timeline to the Pokemon franchise as a whole. So without further ado, let's get into this, grab a popcorn, hide under your blanket, and let's enjoy the video in this dark, gruesome tale of a canon event in the Pokemon franchise. So unlike the story of the ghost girl and the death of the girl in the dark red tail, this story is a lot different and a lot more deep than the other ones. It's a lot more complex too, because you need to kind of unravel the pieces and put them in together like a puzzle, because it requires you to look at all the different types of media in the Pokemon franchise. This story takes place and begins in the Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon games, and it's accessible via the Ultra Wormhole that you get at the end of the game before you beat Ultra Necrozma. So these portals send you to different dimensions, right, and gives you opportunities to catch different legendaries as well as Ultra Beasts. These Pokemon you encounter via these Ultra Wormholes that transport you to alternate universes, or parallel worlds for that matter. And in some of them, you get the Ultra Beast worlds, right? You get Kartana in his like, samurai-esque village type thing. Or if you go into Zerkatree's dimension, it's like this power plant of sorts. And this is the same with all the other Ultra Beasts in the sense that the realms they're in are just detailing or just showing you the appearance and characteristics of that Pokemon. But there is one realm that isn't detailing any characteristics for that particular Pokemon, but rather showing you the events that occurred in its universe, with the title of the Ultra Wormhole being Ultra Ruins. Now immediately when you enter the wormhole, you are already met with this unsettling feeling as if you remember this, but also don't at the same time. And as the music starts to creep in, you start to realize what really is going on. Unlike the other Ultra Beast wormholes, this one is just completely different and doesn't seem anything like you would imagine Guzzlord's wormhole to be. But as you start to move forward, you find yourself realizing that this is your world. It's not just a random civilization like all the other Ultra Wormholes, it is Haoli City, as you can see the signs and the buildings, they're so similar, and even the sign detailing that this is in fact the entrance to Haoli City. And as you slowly move up and up and up, you find yourself standing behind Guzzlord itself. But even after catching Guzzlord, you're just met with the same question, what exactly happened? Now, this question on the surface might be easy to answer, but it's actually quite difficult. Because after all, the Ultra Beasts themselves aren't originally from our universe. So now we have to put our detective glasses on and try to figure out what exactly happened in that Ultra Ruin wormhole, or as we like to call it, the Ultra Ruins timeline. Now first and foremost, let's list what we know. We know that this takes place in our set universe. Not the exact universe we're in, or we were born in I should say, but a universe parallel to it. So almost like an alternate or exact copy, except in the alternate timeline, we weren't as fortunate. And lastly, what we also know is that this wasn't all Guzzlord's doing. Although Guzzlord itself is a very strong Ultra Beast, it couldn't wreak havoc upon the entirety of the planet. As we look into the sky, we see the brown smoke, and that is the new sky. So we know that this kind of catastrophic damage was not just dealt by Guzzlord himself, but rather by a upper being or a higher level entity. As I'm telling you this, you can kind of now connect the dots. Now in our main timeline, we fought against a higher level entity known as Necrozma, or the blinding one in this case. Necrozma itself was a fairly weak legendary, but what made him so strong was the recovery of his light energy or his light essence by absorbing either Lunala or Sogaleo. Now after the absorption of those Pokemon, 
Necrozma then transformed into Dustmane or Donwing's Necrozma. This not only furthered his power, but also gave him the ability to open up cracks in the sky, known as wormholes, and bring in Ultra Beasts from other alternate dimensions, including, you guessed it, Guzzlord. Now, in our main timeline, we actually beat Ultra Necrozma, but in the Ultra Ruins timeline, you can kind of see what happened in here. Guzzlord's roaming Howley City, and as you look up in the sky, it is just brown, seeing the destruction and havoc that occurred in this universe, further proving that Ultra Necrozma quite indeed wreaked havoc upon this land, and we lost our battle against the Blinding One. That is why we see Guzzlord's roaming Howley City, and likely all the other Ultra Beasts as well, because Ultra Necrozma is the one who reigns supreme over the earth. All our favorite characters, Cynthia, Red, Sun, Moon, Lily, either succumbed to the parasitic Neoligos or were brutally murdered and eaten alive by Guzzlords. But now that we answered the what in this scenario, now we have to answer the how. How did this happen? After all, there's so many strong legendaries on Earth that could have probably taken Necrozma now. We had Zygarde 100%, we had Mewtwo, Xerneas, and Veltal, and although your suspicions are very valid, they're not completely right, in a sense. For example, there's three different paths that the Sun and Moon timeline could have taken. Number one is the one in the manga, where Zygarde 100%, alongside Sovaleo and Lunala, whom survived against Necrozma, were the ones to put him down for good. And in the Sun and Moon games, the original ones before the remakes, Necrozma never had that filled with rage and vengeance that he had in the Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon timelines. Instead, he never obtained Ultra Necrozma level power because he never sought Sogaleo and Nala. But in the Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon timeline, we ourselves, the characters Sun and Moon, beat Ultra Necrozma single handedly without the need of other legendaries other than the Tapus who are fighting against the Ultra Beasts, as well as Lunala or Sogaleo, depending on which game you played. So first off, I want to answer a few points. Why wasn't Zygarde there to help in the Ultra Ruin timeline? Now that answer is quite literally very easy to explain, and that's simply he was there, it's just that he wasn't strong enough to beat Ultra Necrozma alone. You see, in the manga, Zygarde had help from Sogaleo and Lunala, but he was also defenseless because he had to protect Sun and Moon and the rest of the gang from Ultra Necrozma's attacks, so he was being on the defensive side while trying to attack and hurt Ultra Necrozma in order to protect all of Alola and the rest of the world. But in the Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon timeline, the Ruin timeline specifically, he was there, we can safely assume that, but he just wasn't strong enough to beat them because, again, unlike the manga, Ultra Necrozma consumed Sogaleo and Lunala, so he had no backup as well as a whole planet to defend while also fighting the strongest enemy he's ever faced. This goes for Xerneas and Eveltal, whom are both relative to 50% Zygarde, and 50% Zygarde isn't doing anything to Ultra Necrozma, only 100% can do any meaningful damage. So all the other legendaries are pretty much fodder, other than like 100% Zygarde as well as maybe Mewtwo, but like that's pretty much it. But you might be asking, what about Regigigas, Darkrai, and Cresselia? Darkrai and Regigigas both are relative to the avatars of the creation trio, being Palkia and Dialga, and Cresselia is equal to Darkrai, meaning she's also relative to Dialga and Palkia. So basically you're saying that they couldn't lose to Ultra Necrozma, and you are completely right, they would definitely beat Ultra Necrozma single-handedly. But the problem is that there's this idea that I have which basically justifies this timeline, and to put it simply, it's not that they couldn't be Ultra Necrozma, but rather they didn't purposely. So for example, in Regigigas' case, he's in deep slumber in the Temple of Sinnoh. In Dark Rice's case, in Cresselia's also, they don't intervene with earthly matters, but rather go along their merrily way. Now, Dark Rye and Cresselia and Regigigas likely probably oversaw what was happening, 
but it's just that either A, it was just too late, or they didn't intervene at all. Those are the two likely outcomes. Now, although both outcomes are very justified, I think the first one is definitely more plausible than the second, because in the first one, we have actual basis. Reggie Gigas was definitely in deep slumber, which makes the most sense, as well as Darkrai and Cresselia most likely beating Ultra and Kurosma, but the damage to Alola and likely other regions was already done. Now, an argument a lot of people have about this timeline is where was Arceus during this? Why didn't he stop this destruction and chaos that occurred because of Ultra Necrozma? And to put it simply, it's not that he hates us or hates everybody in this franchise, it's just that he doesn't intervene. What his creations are or meant to be is both of good nature and bad nature and whatever comes out of it, it comes out of it. So it's not that he's hateful or unjust, it's just that these are the candid events and this is what's supposed to happen. Not every timeline is going to be as happy and dandy as the others. There will always be those with cruel fates and unjust realities. And that is the end of the Ultra Ruin timeline. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe and share this video with a friend on your way out because I do want to share the lower Pokemon because it is very thrilling and exciting and it just requires a bit of dabbling into the text and dialogue of some of these stories. So thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.